Kia ora, talofa, namaste, hi to my, and welcome to this week's episode of the Niche Cache a variety show coming at you from Aotearoa and the Niche Cache, the niche-cache.com where you can read about Aotearoa sports and just find all sorts of different yarns and kōrero about Aotearoa sport. We are here today to drop our favourite Kiwi sporting things from the weekend and prior to the variety show we did record our uh, podcast for the Patreon Fano that will also be sent out to subscribers, paid subscribers on Substack as well. This week's uh, episode, we talked a bit about the All Whites situation this morning. Nico the Wildcard's going to talk some All Whites football in the variety show and recap some of that stuff. But we did get into some of the the murky underwaters of whatever the crack was happening there with the All Whites uh, defeating Qatar 1-0. Big up the man dem, uh, Marco Stamenich, the also Marco Stamenich first goal for the All Whites. And let's, I'm just going to, I'm just going to spin this. I'm just going to go full spin mode, full Danny Vittori, ripping, ripping the lefties, full spin here. Tuesday, big win for the All Whites over Qatar, bounced back after the loss against Sweden and the All Whites dominated Qatar, 1-0, fantastic victory for the All Whites, shout out. Get the clean sheet too. Clean sheet, defence was on fire, big Qatar, who are they in football? They're no one, we're Aotearoa and we defeated the uh, Qatari team, so big up Marco Staminic and as we said in the Patreon podcast, we counted... Marco Staminich, Michael Boxel, Bill Tuiloma, Max Mata, as uh, four Polynesians playing for the All Whites, which was pretty epic as well. We talked about that in our Patreon podcast, also sending out to the Substack subscribers, as well as updating some T20 Blast stuff with Black Caps World Cup context. Weekly Black Caps quote it all there. So that podcast goes out to our patreon and paid substack subscribers you can support the niche cache either way however you want it whatever works for you there's an extra podcast for you there every week patreon is patreon.com forward slash our niche cache you can sign up drop us a note get in touch and jam that extra podcast as well as the uh subscribing on substack now you don't need to pay to get the newsletters on Substack. Every Monday and Friday, we send out our email newsletters via Substack, writing all about Aotearoa sports. We've got the links to the website yarns. We've got the podcast information there. That goes out to all subscribers every Monday and Friday evening. Then if you do want to use the paid Substack subscription service, the podcast we recorded earlier will be sent out to you there as well. So it's basically the website, the niche-cache.com, Patreon, patreon.com forward slash our niche cache, and Substack, the niche-cache.substack.com. You can uh, subscribe on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening to this on a podcast, make sure you jam, give it a like, give it a rate, give it a review. Just do all the usual 2023 stuff that helps keep the wheels in motion. Motion is lotion. How about that one? Move your body and then you, everything, a uh, bit of CRC oil grease in your joints. That's just a early dose of mindfulness there for you. But however you want to do it, just support the niche case. We got um, clips on our Twitter, clips on our Instagram, doing like little Kiwi sports clips on the YouTube shorts as well. We're just out here doing our best for Aotearoa sport that we can do. And we appreciate everyone who listens, everyone that does do a bit of reading about Aotearoa sport as well. Busy show ahead. Plenty to chat about. Have you got some mindfulness? Well, apart from the the early dose of mindfulness that we've already had, um, it was a I good do one too. Just, but I've can got I it. just specify a bit? Yeah, so go. If you're, an easy way to think about it is if you wake up and you're sore, motion is the lotion that grooves your gears so the best way to get out of that soreness the best way to get um to fix things in your body is to move your body so motion is lotion yeah get the blood flowing um 
I I got a knee injury at the moment. It's the same thing. When I don't, when I sit back and rest it and don't do anything, it gets worse. And when I actually like go to football training and make sure you know got to warm up first, it takes a bit longer than usual, but get the blood flow in there, it actually feels better. So I've got firsthand experience of that working. Also have a um, mindfulness quote prepared from Kakuzo Okakura, who wrote uh, the Book of Tea which is a thing like a Japanese text about um, tea ceremonies and, you know, just mindful drinking of beverages and such, which I haven't actually read. I've had this book for a while, but um, I don't need to get around to this. It's only a short thing. It's only like 80 pages or something. Anyway, um, his quote that I got here goes, those who cannot feel the littleness of great things in themselves are apt to overlook the greatness of little things in others. Bit of a word. Well, seesaw's a little bit. There's yeah, yeah there's, there's like there. six different spins on that one. The the littleness of great things in themselves to overlook the greatness of little things in others. It's like flipping back and forth, but yeah. Yeah, you're gonna have to take the reins on that one. Well, I believe what he's trying to say is that um, uh, the great things in ourselves aren't as great as we tend to think they are. And if you can't keep humility about those things, potentially, um, the who can't you know to feel the littleness of great things in themselves, I'm assuming that's what that means is basically just stay humble, in order to therefore appreciate the greatness of little things and others, which seems to you know, tell its own story there is, is being able to respect the things that set others apart comes from being humble in ourselves, I, I'd imagine. Beauty. Might need to workshop that one just to simplify it. Oh, I'll, 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 I'll get the um, Ouija board out and summon up his ghost and tell him that he's, he used too many words on that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll sort him out. Hey, uh, get the editor on that one. Um, right it's here, a nice poetic turn of phrase, though. Let's crack into some Aotearoa sport. My leading banger from the weekend was Joey Manu from Tokoroa playing fullback for the Roosters in their victory over the Knights. This was interesting because the Roosters got, I think they got smoked by the Panthers the week before, but prior to that, they defeated the Bulldogs thanks to James Tedesco at fullback. This weekend, they defeated the Knights thanks to Joseph Manu at fullback. He had 29 runs for 318 meters, averaging out at 10, or averaging out at 11 meters per run. This is not uh, unique for Joey Manu. This is what he does at fullback every time he plays fullback. And I think state of origin, Joseph Manu is the best Joseph Manu because he tends to do this when Tedesco is out playing state of origin. Lest we forget, last year, when Joey Manu played for Aotearoa Kiwis in the win over Tonga, and he had 32 runs and 401 metres at 12.5 metres per run. So Joey Manu at fullback is an absolute monster. I think he said in a post-game interview in his, uh, in his own humble way, he said, I just love to run the footy. I just want to run the footy. And... I don't think it takes a rocket scientist to figure out that that is better suited to fullback than number six because I think part of the Roosters issue is the distribution flow, the passing, and a bit of zip. Joey Manu is a very strong runner, but he's not a quick, nimble runner necessarily, and he's not a great passer. But he is great at offloads, he is great at running the footy, and that is just better suited to fullback or centre where the Roosters can put Joey Manu in other areas while Tedesco's playing fullback, you can have Joey Manu roaming. They've done that before. And we've also seen Joey Manu star at fullback before as well. The interesting thing for the Roosters now is that Luke Carey was out injured in that game. Sam Walker's got a bit of a knee issue. So they're missing two halves probably for their next game or two. Tedesco might come back from origin. So that might put Joey Manu back at number six. Ideally, it doesn't. Like the Roosters might have Drew Hutchinson play number six and Sandon Smith, who was very good. Your mate Sandon Smith. He was very good for the Roosters at halfback. So I think the Roosters' best combination is 
Sandon Smith and Hutchison with Joey Manu at centre. Tedesco at fullback. If there's no Tedesco, you just put Joey Manu at fullback. Because Joey Manu at fullback is an absolute star. I think he is still the best Aotearoa Kiwis fullback after this performance. If Joey Manu was struggling and not playing fullback for the Roosters, that would make things a bit iffy for Aotearoa Kiwis because Sean's Nickel Crookstar is playing fantastic footy at fullback. Work with me here because Joey Manu at fullback means Sean's Nickel Crookstar plays centre. If Sean's Nickel Crookstar is playing fullback, then Joey Manu is playing centre. So they both, they're both doing the same job. They're both covering the same positions. I think this performance, though, really hammered home how good Joseph Manu is at fullback. And he has a fantastic record at fullback for the Roosters and the Aotearoa Kiwis. And he was absolutely fantastic in dragging the Roosters to victory over the nights in Newcastle. What is your leading banger from the Aotearoa Sporting Weekend slash this morning <laughs> slash this morning yeah well i i half wanted to um chuck some joseph manu versus kaylin ponga battle into my thing i thought that's stepping on your toes too much because you'll surely have that high, nice and high but we did talk about it on thursday and it was like i was watching that game after i got back from football and it was absolute blockbuster stuff from both of them actually but uh you know manu taking the cake no my my leading banger is that uh the all weights game this morning descended into some surreal activities against Qatar when it got abandoned at halftime at the behest of the all whites um sounds like predominantly the playing staff were were making the call there uh because of a an incident of racial abuse against Michael Boxall late in the first half which was yeah as I say a bit surreal as the 40th minute um I think the issue in terms of abandoning the game based on the statement from New Zealand football at least is less to do with the fact that racism happened therefore we don't want to play anymore it's a bit more about some racism happened and the referee did not adequately respond to it or in fact even seem to just like belittle it and not um you know, shrug it off and not pay much attention to it and therefore the game ended up getting abandoned um but yeah it was strange because the halftime uh, <laughs> break just kept on going and you watching dudes walking around the sidelines making phone calls you're watching tim cahill trying to calm down carlos querosh in the qatari bench which i got a feel for tim cahill who is of course himself someone and it was a someone player who was uh abused in the first place so i gotta think he's in a little bit of a tricky spot there um yeah but when the ball boys started you know cleaning things up and bringing the gear back in from the other side of the field it's like yeah okay we've clearly got a situation here this is some, something's not continuing it's you know it's the all whites will one up against Qatar and they're playing really well and i will talk about this in my next point but um they they had an opportunity to get what was going to be their best result for probably quite a number of years to be honest considering Qatar you know host of the last world cup rate ranked considerably above them in the the standings and they were outplaying them and well worth their lead at that point um but you also got to you know just the to have the courage of their convictions the way they did is also quite a um quite a, a proud and empowering thing from what is in a lot of ways quite a young always squad i mean they've got a few big veterans in there but it's also like you know, joe bell is about 23 and he was the captain in these games and he was leading the call talking to the referee there and it is a tight next squad and the players are big drivers in the culture at the moment for that always team and michael boxall of course himself highly valued veteran within the squad a squad which had three Samoan, uh, three players of Samoan heritage on the field at that time michael boxall bill tuiloma and also michael staminich who had scored the goal um you already mentioned tim cahill on the bench for the other team as well it, it was only a friendly. So, you know, realistically, this this isn't going to have ramifications on a footballing sense. It's like you missed out on a win against Qatar. That is a shame. But also, you still got the 45 minutes of a good performance, the the belief you can take from that. And they're not going to, you know, fail to qualify for a World Cup because of this or anything like that. And hopefully, it's going to be something that can actually, like, spark a bit of actual progress in this ongoing battle that football seems to have it is the biggest sport in the world it is the most multicultural sport as a result you got players from all across the world crossing paths with the popularity of football which i guess 
exacerbate some of this stuff. Um, not helped by the fact that some authorities just don't seem to pay it that much mind. And one of those is FIFA, of course. And their FIFA has been under some pressure for this because there was the Vinicius Jr. situation with Real Madrid recently with just obscene racial abuse that he's been copping all season and beyond that. Um, but it came to a head late in Real Madrid season. And like he was meeting with FIFA president Gianni Infantino recently and they were talking, Infantino was talking about like, yeah, we're going to put a task force together. Vinicius is going to be on that task force. We're going to come up with ideas and, and whatever. Um, he had a quote five days ago. He had a quote saying that, yeah, there's, there, there is no football um, if there is racism involved. As far as I'm concerned, everyone paraphrasing, obviously, but as far as I'm concerned is like, if an incident like this happens, the referees should be calling things off straight away and, you know, deal with it before the players can come back out or whatever. And obviously this referee didn't deal with it. And that's where we are right now. But that puts FIFA in an interesting position because here's your first major incident to actually show that you mean what you say when you when you say these things, which frankly it's FIFA, so I'm not holding out much hope, but it's it's an opportunity that will be quite interesting just to see how the reaction goes, particularly um around the world with some of this stuff. I think we kind of know what how Qatar are gonna bend down the hatches and respond with New Zealand football have already backed their players and and the actions and whatever. So we'll see we'll see what the authorities do. Um but yeah. It's, it's hard not to be cynical about these things, unfortunately, because that's that's how uh, that's how football seems to go at that level. My second thing, and I'm rolling out three NRL Kiwi NRL things for this week's variety show. Will Warbrick, Kawato's finest, he scored four tries for the Melbourne Storm in their victory over the West Tigers, and this is what Will Warbrick does in rugby league. In the NRL this season, Will Warbrick has 11 tries in 14 games. Last year for the Sunshine Coast Falcons, while he was being stashed in Queensland Cup by the Melbourne Storm, 10 tries in 14 games. So he's played the same amount of games this year as he did last year, and he's basically got the same amount of tries. All up, Will Warbrick has played 28 games of top level rugby league and he's scored 21 tries 21 tries in 28 games for will warbrick he is really good at rugby league and i think he's going to be an aotearoa kiwis winger i still have him like there's uh jordan rapina ronaldo molotalo jermaine sako are probably the dylan watanese elizniak has been in resurgent form as well and Will Warbrick, who are all from different areas of Aotearoa. Ronaldo Molotalo, he's from Otara. Jermaine Sarko, he's from Christchurch. Jordan Rapin is from Wellington. D Dylan Whiten is the Lesniak's from Waikato. And Will Warbrick, he is from Kaurau. So lots of nice depth there. But Will Warbrick, he loves a try. And he is continuing to develop nicely with the Melbourne Storm. All whites football, what do you reckon? Yeah, well, got through the um, the unsavory stuff. Now for the actual football, they did play against Sweden a few days earlier. They lost 4-1. Doesn't sound great. But to be honest, it was mostly pretty good performance. It was, for 30 minutes, they they were, you know, they were 1-0 up there. And I genuinely felt like, well, hey, you know, there's, there's a chance here. <laughs> there's, there's an opportunity here for the always to do something. And then they fell to pieces in the last sort of 10 minutes of the of the first half. They conceded three goals in seven minutes, all from giving up the ball in their own half, just not being able to handle the the high press of what Sweden were doing. Even though it was a reserve team from Sweden, it was still, you know, it's Sweden. They're, they're a top 25 ranked team in the world. They know what they're doing. They got plenty of depth. Um, and they punished the All Whites for little lapses. That, that seven minute spell that killed them. And it was interesting against Qatar because they did have some similar lapses against Qatar. It would be a lie to say that it was all flawless in their first half. Um, it was it was not. They were one 0 up against Qatar. They were playing excellent football, some of the best football I've seen them play, to be honest, for for quite a while. And on target for what would have been, I already said, like would would have been one of their best results for a while, um, several years. Very different vibe because Sweden, although it wasn't exactly a sellout in Stockholm, it was still, you know, it's, it's like 20,000 fans or something there and most of them Swedish and lots of color, lots of atmosphere. And against Qatar in Austria, it was almost empty. <laughs> the only fans that were there were behind the cameras so you couldn't see them. 
um so we didn't hear much it did have a bit of a like training game kind of vibe but i think that might have helped the all whites in a way it just took the pressure off and it, they were just pinging the ball around smoothly sharply it was good movement there was really like yeah really excellent stuff um marco stamina scored a banger of a goal callum mccowan has scored the goal against uh against sweden both really good goals also means they scored in both of these games even though one of them they only played half a game they still got a goal having scored a couple times in the win over China before that, remember they'd gone like five or six games without a goal prior to that. So they've now, you know, managing to score in both these games is a significant thing. Um, it was interesting, like Qatar, the reason the All Whites were in a position to beat Qatar is because Qatar weren't at the same level as Sweden. They didn't punish them for their mistakes the same way that Sweden had punished them pretty ruthlessly for their mistakes. But that's fine. They are at different levels. The All Whites are trying to progress things. You don't skip six spots in order to go straight to beating Sweden when you couldn't beat, um, you know, Oman a few weeks, a uh, few months ago or a year ago. Um, it is a it is a progress, and this was another step forward, um, a process rather. This was another step forward for the All Whites, and I think honestly, as much as the headlines will obviously be about the um, the 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 incident of racial abuse and the response and all this kind of thing. I think buried behind that was a pretty promising tour from the All Whites, in which we're really starting to see some of these young dudes, like I think Joe Bell, fantastic throughout all three halves, Libby Kakache, Marco Stamanic as well, guys like that in particular. I'd say them, them three were the big standouts. Really, these young players playing at a high level really starting to now like get comfortable at the international level so it's exciting stuff for the all whites and they should have you know they should have games in at least two more international windows throughout this year so they, you know just didn't get to finish the guitar one but we'll just pick up where we left off next time big win over guitar shout out to big win yeah big win. <laughs> my third thing here is dejan arcy playing for the Parramatta eels in two wins back-to-back -back wins for dejan arcy and the Parramatta eels two wins playing two different roles last week he played in the win against the bulldogs Dejan Asi replaced dylan brown and played alongside mitchell moses so what does that mean it means Dejan Asi has less touches and a bit more running mahi and less kicking because mitchell moses does all the kicking so he had 73 kicking meters and 44 touches he had two try assists two tackle breaks he was a bit more dynamic running the footy against the sea eagles suddenly dejan arcy is the halfback so he is mitchell moses and ryan madison is what dejan arcy was and what dylan brown was so now dejan arcy plays as a halfback steering the eels around and he has 479 kicking meters so he goes from 73 kicking meters against the bulldogs to 479 kicking meters against the sea eagles no force dropouts against the bulldogs two force dropouts against the bulldogs uh, against the sea eagles he also has 20 more touches from game to game um, and there's a slight improvement in his def defensive mahi for the uh, in the, from the sea eagles game two games two wins that's the same amount of wins that dejan Arcy had in eight games for the warriors and this is and he didn't have any wins in the season prior with the cowboys in fact in two years with the cowboys 10 games one win now dejan Arcy has played in two games for the eels he is playing because the eels are missing one of their halves and yet the eels still win and dejan arcy aranui jr from christchurch he shines in two completely different roles replacing dylan brown it's more about running the footy making your tackles and playing second fiddle to mitchell moses and clint gutherson against the sea eagles now Dejan Arce is steering the team around. He does most of the kicking. Of course, Clint Gutherson was still there. He's still barking out orders. He's still popping up for offloads and um, a lot of classy touches. But it's Dejan Arce who does all the kicking. And it's Dejan Arce who's playing a lot of first receiver. So I've been really impressed with Dejan Arce in his two appearances for the Eels, especially considering 
He play, he started the season at centre in New South Wales Cup for the Eels, and he's been chopping and changing between fullback and 5 8. So the win against the Sea Eagles this weekend, weekend just gone, was his first game this season at halfback. And he's doing some good things. So shout out Dejan Asi. What else you got? Yeah, it's time for some basketball here because the Tall Ferns have named their squad for the Asia Cup. We did just have them going off to Europe and playing a few games there, including a win over Poland, which was good fun. Um, they had a couple injuries leading into that tour. There was 12 players that went along, um, plus I think there was another player that went along as a, as a training player. So there wasn't fully their top squad. Um, quite an experienced group. We have had with the uh, with the Asia Cup squad that's been named, there have been four changes. We've got overall just a, the 12 players who are going. It's Stella Beck, Taylor Dalton, Panina Davidson, Grace Hunter, Charlize Ledger-Walker, Crystal Ledger-Walker, Paris Mason, Ezra McGoldrick, Tara Reid, Retoya Tamilo, Josie Truesdell, and Talia Tupaya. So the four players who've come in since the uh, since the European tour, which to be honest, like four is, I, I said there were a couple of unavailable players. Um, four is more changes than I was expecting to see. I was thinking one or two, just a couple injury things. But, you know, it's, it's, um, they're mixing it up. Uh, Mason is one of those. McGoldrick, Trusdell, and Tupaya are the four who have come in. Paris Mason and um, Talia Tupaya are both uncapped, so they'll be making their debuts for the Skull Ferns at the Asia Cup. And both really quite interesting um, careers to this point because Paris Mason was also an absolute gun netball player but played for the Tokomanoa Queens in the uh, Tauihi last year and won a championship as one of their young player, sort of role players on the bench there. Um, she seems to have been leaning further and further into the into the basketball scene now since then. And this is, you know, coincided with a, well, not coincided, but directly led to a tall Ferns call-up. And Talia Tupaya played age grey level for Australia. And as an import player, was the MVP of the Tauihi League last year. Well, she's since um, changed her allegiances to commit to play for Aotearoa and would have been on that European tour had she not been one of the ones that I mentioned that was injured. She's now back to fitness. She's also re-signed for the Tauihi again. So she's in the squad and will probably be quite an important player for them. So that's quite exciting to see how that is going to go. Um, target at the Asia Cup is top four. It's about try and make to the semifinals. They've never done that before. They've only had a couple opportunities since they've been playing in the um since they've been playing since Oceania basically has been swept up into the Asia Conference. Uh, fifth place is their best result. They'll be going for top four specifically because obviously it would be their best ever effort, but also top four and they stay alive in Olympic qualifiers as well and get to advance to one of those Olympic qualifying tournaments uh, you know, in six months or whenever that will be. So a lot on the line for the Tall Ferns at the Asia Cup and it should be pretty exciting. I mean, you've got Topaya is obviously going to be a key injection as someone who can come in and score points. Charlie Sledger Walker is going to be our greatest ever basketballer. So no dramas there. Catch her on the ups. A um, few, you know, Stella Beck and Panina Davidson, good experience there. And then Josie Truesdale as well offers a bit of experience coming in. And you've got some good young players, good prospects there as well. So we'll be following that one pretty closely. Tall Ferns at the Asia Cup. Tall Ferns at the Asia Cup. And we got Black Sticks hockey in the Pro League. We have had a pretty okay string of results, although nothing to um, you know, scream from the treetops about. The Black Six men, they had a 1-6 loss to Argentina. Then they had a 1-3 loss to Belgium. They had a 2-2 draw and a shootout loss against Argentina. So they've played three games. They've had a draw and two losses. The women, they did manage a cheeky victory over Argentina 2-1. Then they lost uh, 0-7 to the Belgium team. And they face Argentina again overnight tonight. This means that the men are still last on the ladder. They've played 11 games. They've had two draws and nine losses. No victories. They're on three points. They've got a minus 25 goal difference. They're on three points. Eighth place Germany are on 11 points. So the Black Sticks men are eight points behind the team above them. And their negative 25 goal difference is definitely the worst 
in the pro league, the women, they praise Ja. They're eighth, so they're not last. The USA is last. The Black Six women have two wins, two draws, and six losses, negative 15 goal difference, and they are one point ahead of the USA. So these are really important games for the Black Six women to try to stay off the bottom of the pro league ladder, and that might be boosted by another victory over Argentina. Argentina, who are second. So we've had some strong results. A win for the Black Six Women over Argentina. A draw with the men against Argentina. But we'll see what happens um, consistently with more games played. A victory for the women against Argentina will hopefully keep them off the bottom of the ladder. But we'll wait and see what else you've got. Yeah, NBL yarns. So just a few, like, you know, from the old uh, NBL notebook over the last few days, one note is that Kellen McRae has absolutely moved the needle for the Nelson Giants. He had 26-8 and eight in his first game. He had 21-12 and 12 in his most recent. Those were both wins against Canterbury and Hawks Bay. So both teams that they're sort of competing with to try to get to Canterbury, a team above them, and Hawks Bay, a team right in the same mix trying to get top six. Giants are up into the top six now. They're looking pretty good. Excited to see them uh, kick on and hopefully McRae to, you know, if you're looking for a big man in the Aussie NBL, you know, just not that you could do a lot worse. Um, also on the rise of the Franklin Bulls, who smoked Southland on the weekend and coach Dan Sokolowski still wasn't happy. They interviewed him at the end. He's like, you're 20, Casey Frank, I think it was. He's like, um, coach Sokolowski, you're 20 points up. What do you, what do you want to see from, um, what do you, what do you want to see from you guys the rest of the way? And he's like, well, basically we need to improve on everything. It's not good enough as well. You know, sometimes I think coaches just need to catch a break. So <laughs> just enjoy a victory, but still um, high standard. That's why that team is looking good. Jared Wilson frame, I think started the season with Canterbury. He's switched over to Franklin and really given them just a, just another, um, another angle to attack from alongside, uh, Jamal Brantley, the other Brantley brother, and Ricky McGill, who Ricky McGill's been great all season. He he does a little bit of everything for them. Also getting solid minutes from local starters, Isaac Davidson and, and Dan Fotu. Plus, sneaky on one on the bench, mid-season pickup, Matthew Freeman really seems to help me. He's a sort of power forward. He was at Oklahoma State at the same time as Stephen Adams was playing for Oklahoma City Thunder, which is why I remember him quite fondly. But he's looked really good. He's just coming. He's a big man, but he's got uh, Dara, it's not, it's not exactly Stephen Adams kind of um, variety of skill, but he really does have a nice, like, nice touch. He's a nice shooter. He's a good player. He's he's really helped them. Um, however, the Tuatara is still the team to beat. They top the Sharks also on the weekend with room to spare. Seven wins in a row for them now. They're out in first. Rob Lowe and that Sharks win at 32 points, 19 rebounds and four assists, shooting 14 of 18 from the field. Um, I think he's actually had like three 30-point games now as Nuts. Um, Ruben Tarangi scored 20 in that game as well. Plus, Cruz Perro Hunt is there now. And he's had a little bit rusty in his first couple games, but I expect him to, to kick on pretty strongly. Moving forward, um, Thursday night as well. Lock this one in. Battle of the Webster brothers. Both Ty Webster for Otago and Corey Webster for Canterbury making the season debut. And while we're at it, don't sleep on them. Tell he he's signing. He's starting to get a few of those going now So The Women's League coming up soon. And the five teams there all getting busy. Well, Almost all of them. Um, six of the current Tall Ferns Asia Cup squad are already signed up to be playing in this league. Uh, three of them are at Northland Kahu specifically. Defending champs Tokomano, Tokomanoa Queens, they've been the busiest. They've already got 10 players locked in. The Fly have some work to do, though. The uh, the Mid-North Fly actually haven't signed anyone yet, so they're the, they're getting left behind a little bit. They better, they better crack on. My last thing here, I do want to highlight, Lee Kasprick returns to the White Ferns squad for their tour of Sri Lanka. We know Sri Lanka... Loves a bit of spin bowling, and the White Ferns have... I think the White Ferns spinners are just better than White Ferns, Ferns seamers. Like, White Ferns spin is the strength of White Ferns bowling. Um, and that was pretty solid with Amelia Kerr, Eden Carson, and Fran Jonas. But now they have Lee Kasprick replacing an injured Jess Kerr, and that is important because Lee Kasprick is Aotearoa's best spin bowler. Since the start of uh, 2015, Lee Kasprick, only four, sorry, only four bowlers have taken 50 plus wickets, and Lee Kasprick is the only one averaging below 15 in T20 international cricket. Go over to ODI cricket, four bowlers have taken 50 plus wickets, 
Lee Kasprick's the only one averaging below 20. So Lee Kasprick has been the most efficient, effective spinner basically in the whole period that Amelia Kerr has been playing. Consider that on your Tuesday. What else you got? Yeah, just lastly, um, one from the, the National League area stuff. Who's covering that National League football things. It's... <laughs> It's a fun beat to, to follow because it's at times like it's the top domestic league in the country, but then also at other times it's like extremely grassrootsy. And sometimes that can be a little bit embarrassing when you get things like uh, you know, players ineligibility stuff and games being forfeited as has happened a few times. Um, other times it can just be fun and silly and hilarious. Like for example, I think the classic moment was that game at Medill's Farm a few years ago where a dog walked onto the field and took a poo on the edge of the penalty box. Um, that was great. I can remember a time when one of the like dugout things, they put a little tent gazebo thing on the dugout and it blew away. It was like, a, I remember a great one where Brandon Wilson, who was a Phoenix um, player, who was an uh, Aussie midfielder, he was playing a game for the reserves to get some minutes. He got booked twice for the same incident. Like he tripped a guy up and then the ref played um, advantage and then he went and tripped him up again and he got booked for both of them and sent off in the same moment. Uh, that was great. But I think we've got a new one um, to add to the, certainly at least to add to the pile, if not the one to top them all. From the weekend, there was a Chatham Cup game. It was Auckland City at Kuatia Street, I believe it was too. They're playing against Buckland's Beach. So it seemed a few divisions below them. And there were a couple of streakers ran onto the field, which all is it's never don't, don't give too much leeway to the old pitch invaders. Although I do respect it at least a little bit more if you do the streaking thing rather than just running on clothes. If you do that, you're a dickhead. If you streak, at least you're embarrassing yourself at the same time. But equal opportunity league at the New Zealand um, domestic scene is one of these streakers was in a wheelchair. Like, is it just a Shout naked out, dude in a wheelchair? Up, <laughs> I've never seen it before. It's just a, it's a new one to add to the list. It was just a speechless, honestly. Was, I've never seen a wheelchair streaker before, but domestic football has got a bit of everything in this country. Musical Jam, I want to highlight a new track from Moko Mokai titled Roof Rex featuring Brandon Shiraz. Lots of toots, lots of zoots, lots of oos. Lots of uh, watching out for the station wagons with roof racks because anyone, you know, who's done some things, especially those with the vitamins, they know about those station wagons with the roof racks. Watch out. What is your musical jam? Um, a few overseas albums that are real good. The new Jason Isbell one is typically excellent. Um, on a more sort of folksier thing, Anna St. Louis and uh, Jess Williamson both had very good projects that I very much enjoyed. On a local scene, big shout out to the Pickle Darling album that's finally out. Love that one. Shout out to yourself. Big up Aotearoa. And we'll be back on Thursday with another podcast, new episode of the Niche Cast. Otherwise, just check in with all things Niche Cash. Love yourself. Kia kaha. Stay beautiful. Achoo.